In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Life Show, what to do if a Mediterranean diet hurts your gut, the benefits of isometric training, nine ways you could be sabotaging your social life, and much more. Jay, what's up, dude? Hey, man. Enjoying life. What's up with you? Well, we got video now. We, we officially yeah. are a video podcast, which is pretty cool. So if you're if you're listening right now, you can go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash 454. We'll have the video on. I sound a little bit uh, like a broken record because I know I said that in Q&A 453. But I'm just announcing it for about the me- next month or so on podcast episodes. So folks know that we are wearing pants, possibly, but we at least have hair, makeup, whatever else. All fancy that for books sure. On I can't guarantee pants. Strategically placed sponsor items hanging around behind the video camera uh i'm tired i've been i've been burning the candle at both ends recording the audiobook for boundless parenting yeah it's super interesting oh geez there, there's some interesting yeah. stuff in there like, I, I actually have the book right here i have the book right here did you know that i interviewed the liver king for it Obviously, did you really kind of before he got busted <laughs> but i was i was reading the part about his sample day in the life of how his kids eat and move all right so here here's a free preview i'll hold it up to the camera ding a balanced nice. parenting for First you guys plug of the day so pre free preview for anybody who feels like maybe you're uh you're you're really doing a great job turning your children into free thinking resilient little human beings and they're doing burpees after lunch or whatever you probably aren't here's a sample day in the life of how Brian Johnson, a.k.a. the Liver King Kids Eat and Move, based on what he's he's contributed to the book here. 7 a.m., wake just wake up just after sunrise, meaning they're not waking up at 7 a.m. I guess this is what they're doing up until 7 a.m. Wake up just after sunrise and walk down to the lake barefoot connected to the earth, sun gaze, and then do morning workout and chores, branch clearing, vine management, weeds, dogs, etc., If we were at the ranch, they also pick eggs, milk the cows, and gather fruits from the orchard. That's not too bad. No, that's that's pretty reasonable. Gather eggs and take care of the goats in the morning. So they, yeah, you know, scoop poop out of the yard and stuff like that. Okay, that's that's pretty straightforward. That's not a that's not a crazy childhood existence. Eight a.m. Make breakfast using six to eight farm fresh fertilized eggs from a ranch, bone marrow, ghee, and leftover meat from the previous day. His kids aren't having liver for breakfast. This is horrible. Yeah, I don't know. It's not it's not consi- not consistent with branding nope, here. It's not on brand. They're they're not liver princes. Nine a.m. to noon, self taught school and nature time. I could get behind that. Twelve p.m. lunch, cartilaginous, rich not just not just meat, but a cartilaginous, cartilaginous rich cut of meat, liver. There we go, liver at lunch, and a few homemade beef snacks. One to four p.m. afternoon workout, boxing, jujitsu, swimming, cold plunge. Oh, he even has a tip in here. At least one hour away from working out so they don't shut down post-workout inflammation. Hmm, very scientific. And if uh, desired, uh-huh. 40 minutes of earned screen time. By the way, that whole post-workout inflammation thing with cold is kind of a myth. Because all the right. studies that have been done on that, like your muscle core temperature has to get so crazy low. You got to be in like 33 degrees water for 10 plus minutes. I don't know a lot of people who are doing that after a workout. And cold yeah, shower, pretty, jump in a cold lake is not, not going to cause any issues. All right, 4 p.m. That's kind of early. Dinner, always raw liver, raw bone marrow, raw testicles. Why has it got to be raw? It tastes good cooked too, you know. Maybe some yeah. heart and close to a pound of pound of red meat. We also include potatoes or rice and avocados with real olive oil. It's kind of funny because like I, my my kids eat meat and fish and stuff for dinner. But they're happy as a clam, literally just like eating rice, rice crackers, and they're like their mom. Rice, <laughs> rice crackers, bread, a piece right. of lettuce. Like if I didn't break out the protein and the meat, they'd never even ask for it. They'd just be like, Interesting. Hey, Dad, I'm going to make rice again. The little vinegar, huh. piece of lettuce. That's just, they're just little carboholic kids. Um, <laughs> My I mean, kids are a, more on the carni- carnivorous side, but not raw yeah. testicles and liver. Uh, I yeah. haven't done that that yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, family wake surfing. Okay, so they're doing dinner early. 5 p.m. family wake surfing. That sounds fun. 6 p.m. walk and free time to hang out as brothers or with friends. 7 p.m. hang out with dad. Bedtime, wind down the day, and begin an optimized sleep routine. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's not that's not that bad of a day. It's an early dinner, but a lot of people are into that early dinner thing. I'm not. I like to have all yeah. this stuff done yeah. before we get to dinner. 
Yeah, I like, know, to do, I, I like to do all my family wakeboarding before dinner or after dinner right, or before dinner, right. I mean. Yeah. So, hmm. you know, what's interesting, I think that most people in the health, wellness, optimization community would hear a lot of those components and not think a lot about them other than like, yes, they're great. Yeah. It's the, it's the food. It's the nutritional components that I'm like, man, if I tried to present that to my kid, to my wife, to myself at times, it'd be, pr- it'd be the challenge to say the least. Um, you mean, and, the, do you mean the raw liver and bone marrow part? Yeah, that part, that part. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Well, did, did, how old are his kids? Does he stay in the book or do you know? I heard, dude, I just closed the book. It's six hundred ah, pages long. I'm not gonna find that. You're section. supposed to. You're See supposed if I randomly to know open it. to it. Boom. How old are his kids? They're like young teenage boys. I forget their. Oh, exact okay, age. gotcha. I mean, yeah. I have a five year old um, and a three year old, so I don't, I don't know how much that would fly with a five year old and a three year old. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the show before, but I have liver with almost every meal. I, I do. I have a raw liver smoothie every morning. Yeah. So occasionally I take my kids out for waffles or whatever. I'm not bringing raw liver in my fanny pack to the waffle place. But yeah, I have a raw liver smoothie almost every morning. And then I have a huge handful of like those liver capsules with lunch and then often again with dinner. So I technically have liver like three times a day. Yeah. Look at, yeah. Look at no, me. I, I, I t- I take it in desiccated form, like in, in like yeah. liver capsules, but like eating it raw, I actually have never done that. Mm. I'd like to try it at least. Oh, but man, I'm, a little honey and a little salt. It's actually not that bad, but I also think it's kind of a publicity stunt to a certain extent too because it's yeah. raw. Let's face it, raw liver or testicle or heart or anything tastes so much better, like soaked and dredged in egg and flour and fried right. up on the grill with some bacon and onions. I mean – if you're going to do it, I, I say do it right. Or blend it up in a smoothie with a bunch of stuff that makes it taste like chocolate ice cream. That too. Yeah, Have yeah. you seen the new uh, the company? I can't remember what they're called. They're ancestral something. But they're, they're like mass market now or mass market in terms of like sprouts, whole foods type of thing, which I think is mass market. They sell just like a blend of grass-fed beef with heart and liver like – already inside of it kind of i know companies have done that before but these are like Wait, actually like a powder? In supermarkets no 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 no. like actually like in so that you can it's like ground up like in beef so that you can create burgers oh. out of it and you know, can oh, mince yeah. it up and yeah I've, yeah I've seen that and then mark bell uh he's one of my buddies he has what's called the steak shake and yeah, it's like a yeah. protein powder made out of powdered organ meats oh, and then the, the other people the folks at keto brick they they just launched like one of their keto bricks, which is like a 1,000 calorie coconut butter based brick, and they put mm. like meat powder in there, which sounds huh. disgusting, but it's actually it not bad. And I think they put some organ stuff in there too, as well. I believe so. Anyways, uh, all sorts of all sorts of mouth watering tips today <laughs> yeah. for everybody, except vegan people who are throwing up right now. That's um, right. All right. Well, let's launch into today's news flashes, shall we? Let's do it, man. All right. Here we go. Uh, this is the part of the show where we tell you some of the interesting things that I've tweeted out and shared lately on the socials. Uh, some compelling news flashes, articles that I've read that I thought were interesting enough to share with you, etc. I'll put them all at bengreenfieldlife.com slash 454, which is where the show notes reside. Uh, Jay, are you standing up right now? Uh, no, I've been standing up most of the day though. So this is yeah. a reprieve actually. Mm. Uh, I've been okay. up almost all day. Oh, look at you. Uh, okay. So if I go like this and I press my little camera thing here, I'll show you. This is, is nine times out of 10. What's underneath my butt when I'm at my workstation, what I'm holding up mm. is this like upright stool. I'm not necessarily married to any specific brand. This one's a focal upright. I don't think they make it anymore, but it's got a, an extender on the end of it. See like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I can like I can probe. lean up lean up against that, and uh, and and it goes up and down. My kids have a couple as well. They have they have softer padded ones made by a different company. And usually I kind of like lean back like this, and and so I'm kind of sort of standing slash leaning against a stool. And then beside me is a treadmill. And I got to move my camera all over the place to show you the treadmill. But beside me is the treadmill where I'll I'll take a lot of my calls while I'm walking. So I, I am of course into the standing workstation thing. Even this desk I use goes up and down. There's a little button on it, and you push it, and it goes up and down, which is kind of cool. But anyways. I wanted to highlight a, a, a couple of studies. One was very recent. It was a, a randomized controlled crossover study. So pretty well designed study. They found the average blood glucose was higher during a seven hour period of uninterrupted sitting compared to during sitting interrupted with physical activity 
every 30 minutes. And I, I think that that makes pretty good sense. Um, yeah. you know, but the interesting thing is that, uh, this, this other study actually looked at the metabolic effects of breaking prolonged sitting with standing or light walking. And I thought this was more interesting. What they found was that for people, and this was in older adults who were working during the day, they found that in order to actually get metabolic benefits of taking a break from sitting during work, you actually have to move. That standing doesn't actually make that big of an impact in terms of you know burning extra fat or glycemic management or anything. From a metabolic standpoint, you actually have to move. So if you're telling yourself, well, I'm standing for eight hours a day at my standing desk, so I don't need to do like the Pomodoro break and stop and do jumping jacks or walk or sprint or whatever, that's actually wrong. For blood sugar management, you do need to move. Standing is not enough. Now, that being said, that's the metabolic component. Now, from the biomechanical standpoint, yeah, standing can be enough to reduce low back strain and to to get rid of the shortened hip flexors and deactivated glutes and some of the things that you might experience while sitting. Now, of course, I should mention standing can come with its own host of other biomechanical issues, right? Like right. Uh, uh, knee pain if your knees are locked out. Uh, some people will experience, especially if they have poor posture, like an excessive what would be called a lordotic curve. And so they'll also start to get kind of either tight hip flexors or a weak low back or a painful low back when standing, if not standing with good posture. Some people kind of drop into that forward head posture even more when they're standing than when they're sitting. So there's a lot, a lot of additional things to take into consideration here. But ultimately, the main thing I want to let people know based on these studies is that, yeah, standing is good. It's better than sitting in most cases, but you must break up either sedentary standing, which is what I would define just standing around all day as. So sedentary standing or especially sedentary sitting must be broken up with movement to actually see things like the lower triglycerides, the lower blood glucose, the increase in fat burning, et cetera. And in this case, what they did was uh, five minute breaks every 30 minutes, which uh, I have to admit for me. I'm usually closer to like probably two or three minutes every 30 minutes, five, you know, just a complete waste of time, but that's what they did in the study. So there you have it. Yeah. Yeah. Two things, two things about that. Number one is the posture thing is huge. Like for me, I, I, when I first got my standing desk, which has probably been, geez, maybe even 10 years ago now, I, I was like leaning over my desk, like in with horrible posture, just thinking, oh, standing all day is the way to go. And yeah. so after, you know, three or four hours, it was awful. And so I always tell people, it's like <laughs> when you see your posture start to give out and like you're tired, like just sit or like go for a walk, just get away from leaning over and putting all your pressure on the desk. Yeah. The second thing I'm curious on your thoughts, Ben, I know I've heard you talk recently about so like the pace and speed of walking and how that relates to glucose management and metabolic health. I, I don't think from what I could tell, they were looking at the pace of these individuals during that uh, point in time, but I'm assuming no. you would say maybe a little bit more of a rapid pace, not just kind of like a slow stroll for this, um, yeah. for better metabolic health. And most of these studies to control them, they use walking and you are right. Like slightly faster pace is better. That's why I kind of like having a, one of these walking treadmills beside me. That's the manual yeah. treadmill. So I can also run on it if I want to. A lot of the studies use walking, but let's face it. Like there's a kettlebell on the floor of my office behind me so I can do swings. I got a pull-up bar back behind me where I can do the pull-ups. I'll do jumping jacks. I, like, you, you know, shameless plug, but in my book, Boundless, I've got a whole like list, like menu of movement snacks for any given day. So in my opinion, walking's cool, but the, but the disadvantage of walking, unless you have an office treadmill, is you can't. You got to go leave your office. And in some cases, you know, you, you might look like you're shirking your work or whatever. But I mean, you know, if you're just you know banging out some swings ninja style in your cubicle, office space, yeah. nobody or, nobody or, knows. Or if your boss loves the book Deep Work by Cal mm. Newport, you can just talk about it as a productivity meditation. Yes. That two to three minutes productivity meditation can be epic. So I think that's, that's the excuse. Yeah, and by the way, there's a book behind me. I just read, it's uh, Katie Bowman. She's a great biomechanist. I got to get her back on the show. She just sent me two new books. Let's see if my headphone cable is long enough to make it back here and look at one of them. Okay, it's called Re... Okay, got it. Rethink your position. Rethink mm. your position. Um, obviously, desk bound 
by Kelly Starrett is fantastic for this. But this Rethink Your Position book is also really good. I mean, any book written by someone who has removed all furniture from their home, I'm not joking. Oh, uh, really? And like sleeps on the floor without a pillow. Uh, is, is in, but she's a smart biomechanist. And, you know, her kids go to forest school. And it is, it's a cool book. So, yeah, anyways, Rethink Your Position. Uh, check that book out. I'll, I'll make sure I link to it in the show notes bengreenfieldlife.com slash 454. So um, that's what I wanted to mention about movement. Uh, Next, I read an interesting article about um, the the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean diet, obviously a diet that is well proven from a wide variety of epidemiological sources for improving longevity and decreasing risk for a host of chronic diseases, right? And, you know, you can probably, most people say it in their sleep with the Mediterranean diet, vegetables and fruits and whole grains and nuts and low and red and processed meat. And that's kind of, kind of the way that most people would define the Mediterranean diet. Problem is, and this actually keeps a lot of people with princess guts, and I've dealt with this in the past, from eating that kind of like high fiber, high vegetable, grainy, nutty, seedy Mediterranean diet, you know, your giant kale and arugula salads with pumpkin seeds and almonds on them and, you know, two slices of whole wheat bread and then brown rice for dinner with pears and apples. You know, it's, it's very rich in fiber and it's very rich in a lot of fermentable fibers and it's very rich in a lot of the potential uh, plant-based defense mechanisms that can cause digestive distress in a lot of people. And what this paper, which appeared in Frontiers in Nutrition, pointed out was that you have to, if you want to garnish, is garnish a word? Garnish? Garner? Garnish? Some Gar- of the garnish benefits? is a word. I yeah. think it's a, it's garnish some of the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. Did I use that word properly? Or is it garner? I don't, uh, I don't know. When I think of garnish, look that I think up about for something me. being included. All right, I'll look, look it up that for, up for me. Do the what, – what's his name? Do, do, do the, uh, the the Jamie Joe Rogan thing. Look that That's up right. for me. Google that, Jay. Is it garner or garnish? Anyways, um, what what the you have to do is you have to make some modifications because ultimately not only if you're eating packages and processed foods in a Mediterranean context, you've got emulsifiers and thickeners and maltodextrin and artificial sweeteners and – processed food that has titanium dioxide and sulfites and other stuff in it. But then there's also just general uh, uh, foods that would be considered healthy by a quote normal unquote person that a person with irritable bowel or gut issues or gut inflammation simply has to be very careful with on a Mediterranean diet. And I, I think the end of the paper, they have, they have some really great actionable information. So here's the deal. If you're listening and your doctor or your trainer or nutritionist or dietitian or whatever has told you that you'd really benefit from eating the Mediterranean diet, they could be right. But if they're not taking into their consideration, uh, into consideration your gut, and you're having gut issues, bloating, gas, constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, whatever, here's some modifications you can make. First of all, make your fruits and vegetables easy to digest, right? Lots of pureeing, pureeing, lots of blending, lots of mashing. If you get into the fermenting, soaking, sprouting game, great. Peel and de-seed if you can, okay? So there's a little bit more attention that must be paid to plant preparation. Um, Next, they say that a Mediterranean diet free of whole grain bread, pasta, rice, couscous, and other cereals is probably a good idea on a Mediterranean diet. Now at this point, people are probably thinking, wait, you're starting to describe a paleo diet, right? And it's just, you know, it it sounds like I'm just getting rid of grains and a lot of the hard to digest fruits and vegetables and the peeling and the seeding, et cetera. But here's the deal. They say nuts and seeds actually, from what they found, and they looked at a lot of studies in this paper, those actually are pretty tolerated, but you ideally need to grind them. And some like cashews need to be soaked, but you know, you can get like ground flax powder. You can take out a grinder or a Nutribullet and grind your walnuts into a fine powder or your Brazil nuts or macadamia nuts or what have you. Good idea because it's not necessarily the seeds and nuts that are hurting your gut, like the digestive enzyme inhibitors in them. It's just the fact that they they are big, chunky pieces of hard stuff 
not quite as bad as glass, but imagine if you, you're eating bones and glass, how hard that would be on your gut. Well, like one next level down Slightly. from that is the hardness, yeah, understatement of the year, are seeds and nuts. So grind them if you can. Grind them, mortar and pestle, break them down, that type of thing. Um, they actually highly recommend, and this will be something that folks who are following a more ketogenic or low-carb version of the Mediterranean diet need to bear in mind. They recommend avoiding full fat uh, especially full fat dairy products, but a lot of these compounds that are higher in saturated fats. And I found this to be the issue. Sometimes it's gallbladder and liver problems that are contributing to the digestive distress. Sometimes it's small or large intestinal inflammation, but ultimately choosing fats that are a little bit more liquidy, right? Like, uh, there's the Andreas seed oil, right? They do a bunch of cold pressed oils like pumpkin seed oil and hemp seed oil and black seed oil. Those are good choices. Obviously extra virgin olive oil and avocado oil are good choices. Uh, your fatty cuts of fish versus your meatier saturated fat type of cuts of beef, etc. Probably better tolerated, but basically, if you are going to do a low carb or keto version of the Mediterranean diet, or spice up any version of a Mediterranean diet with fats, using more of these like liquid based, monounsaturated, and in moderation, polyunsaturated fats are going to be a better idea than than the chunky, thick, hard fats. Uh, and that would include full fat yogurt and full fat dairy. Even though dairy is something recommended on a Mediterranean diet, you'd want to be pretty careful with that. That being said, by the way, I got to give a head nod to uh, my podcast with Dr. William Davis, where we went over his gut healing super yogurt recipe. Did you try that one at all, Jay? Uh, no, I did not. Oh my gosh, it's so good. But I should. You sleep better, your gut's better. So I always have a couple of big glass mason jars of that up in the fridge now. I'm actually putting the full recipe of it in this next cookbook that I'm working on. But I mean, it's it's not that hard. It's three specific strains you buy on Amazon. Use goat milk, or if you want to do a plant-based milk, you could use like coconut milk, for example. You ferment it for 36 hours with these probiotics in it. Add a little gelatin to thick it up at the end if you want it more thick. And Dr. Davis has actually tested it against things like rifaximin and standard treatments for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which actually mm -hmm. is one of the reasons a lot of people get gut issues and has found that drinking, I think it's like a half cup eating or drinking a half cup of this yogurt for four weeks in a row just eradicates SIBO, which is uh, crazy. Uh, and cool. you get this huge rush in oxytocin, so actually feel pretty good too. And people report weird things like crazy dreams and better sex huh. and all, all sorts of, you know, better skin, their eczema goes away. It's like magic. Yeah. So yeah. So I'll, I'll link to my podcast with them in the show notes. Uh, they also say a couple other tips. They say, um, ditch the legumes, ditch the legumes. If, if you can, at least most of them. Uh, and if you are going to do them, they say lentils or tempeh or tofu seem to be the best tolerated by people with IBD. I think legumes in general, I, I don't meet a lot of people who have gut issues who do well with legumes. So I think that's a that's a good recommendation they give to just avoid even things like, you know, whatever, you know, peas, uh, pea protein, chickpeas, hummus, trini, you know, all that stuff be super careful with. I just spit all over my monitor. Saying, I think I saw it. I think I saw it fly out of your mouth. Probably. Everybody can watch that on yeah, video. Can watch the video. We'll slow mo. It'll be like Shotgun. the Matrix, and you're going like this, Jay. <laughs> watch uh, out, shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last one: hard boiled scrambled eggs or fried eggs may be hard to digest. If you're on the Mediterranean diet and you're using the recommendations that you eat eggs on the Mediterranean diet, choose soft boiled eggs or poached eggs. Soft boiled eggs or poached eggs. That was surprising mm -hmm. to me. I didn't realize there was that much of a difference in terms of digestive distress based on egg preparation methods. So yeah, me either. No, that yeah. is a super interesting yeah. one. Ah. Yeah. So it was good. It's it's like you know if you're having issues with the Mediterranean diet because you have gut problems, it might not be that you got to switch to like a full on like paleo or carnivore or elemental gut healing diet or you know have a smoothie for breakfast, lunch, and dinner or something like that. But in a nutshell, a ground nutshell in this case. Uh, grind mm -hmm. and break down your seeds and nuts, uh, ditch whole grain bread, pasta, rice, couscous, and other cereals. Use easy to digest fruits and vegetables. And when you do fruits and vegetables, try and puree and mash and steam and blend as much as possible. Avoid the full fat versions of dairy and a lot of the marbly cuts of meat and try to choose fish and the more liquid omega-3 rich oils over some of those harder to digest fats. And then finally, a soft boil or poach your eggs and avoid legumes. So there you have it. There it is. 
Yeah. One of my favorite staples of mm-hmm. this is a bit of an off note or a uh, yeah, sidetrack, if you will. One of my favorite staples of the Mediterranean diet is obviously olive oil. Absolutely love it. Did you yeah. hear? Because I thought this was fascinating. I didn't know this was okay. a thing, but apparently it's a thing. So Starbucks is coming out with a coffee that is like infused and mixed with olive oil. So basically, you know, I've heard the whole butter and NCT oil, and I, I did that for you know quite some time, but now uh, they're coming out with an olive oil like coffee which is super There's interesting did not know that was a thing people that will report having shat their pants on the way to <laughs> work because it, they aren't used to putting fats in their coffee we're gonna see what happens <laughs> right. when starbucks unleashes that on the general population that reminds yes. me of something else. Mm-hmm. you ever put a sprig of rosemary into your coffee like if you're doing a french press or even just a pour nah. over it's amazing. Yeah, it's and really yeah. good. And rosemary has a lot of uh, like nootropic like properties on its own for memory and cognition, but it actually mm-hmm. really amps up the flavor of coffee. Like I, I always have been a fan of putting a little salt, a little cinnamon, uh, sometimes a, a bit of like uh, that organic vanilla or butterscotch toffee flavored stevia that oh my yeah. God, organic makes in my coffee. So I do like to dress up my coffee a little bit, but uh, if you do a little bit of salt with a little bit of rosemary, it's actually really good. Really huh, I have to give that a go. I am such yeah. a purist, uh, which I figured you would be Ben growing it's up coffee. with coffee. I figured you'd be like not not put anything in there, which is like what mm. I do. I basically it's just like it's water and coffee for me. Yeah. Uh, and so when I put anything else in there, like it, you know, again, if it's like the mix with butter, MCT oil, or I've never done olive oil, but I'm gonna give it a go, or salt or cinnamon, it always just I feel like it just takes away from that flavor of the coffee it for does. me. Like it's disappointing. It's, it's no longer true coffee. I'll agree. Here's my yeah. hypothesis. I drank so much coffee with a dad as a gourmet coffee roaster and coffee stand and coffee shop owner from the age of 13 onwards that I think I possibly just kind of got bored with black coffee by the time I was like 30. You know, I, I spent almost two decades just yeah. drinking black brew every morning and branched out and started to experiment. And, you know, now regular coffee. Yeah. Actually, I still like regular coffee. Honestly, I do. But it's fun to just experiment with other stuff. Right. Yeah, part of my, no, part of my job sense. to do that and then report back That's on true. the podcast. That's yeah. true. If I ever yeah. get bored of the just flavor of coffee, I will be very surprised by that. So, uh, in twenty years, I'll let you know if I'm still bored. Um, okay. Then you know, I'll Fair I'll enough. look like I'm twenty in twenty years, which will be amazing because of all this biohacking we're doing. That's right, because science. Hey, that's right. Uh, speaking of science, nine research established mental distortions to be aware of. How's that for mm. a segue? Uh, this was an interesting article that appeared on the Art of Manliness, which is a pretty good website. And I thought it was super interesting. Interesting enough to provide conversation fodder for this podcast. I don't know if you took a look at this article, Jay, but it's it's I kind have. of fascinating. Mental distortions. Basically, it was based on the fact that sometimes there's a mismatch between our perception of how others act towards us and how we think others will perceive how we act towards them. And they list nine of these things that we should think about a little bit more if we haven't been placing ourselves in other people's shoes and thinking about some of the things that are myths when it comes to social interactions. So here we go. I just think these are really great. Number one, you underestimate how much you'll enjoy talking to a stranger. You underestimate how much you'll enjoy talking to a stranger. And they say people in subway cars and other public places tend to keep to themselves, listening to music with headphones on or staring into space. They're reluctant to start a conversation because they think people around them are going to reject that conversation because they're strangers. But, and again, a lot of this is research-based. Like I mentioned, studies have found that when you strike up a conversation with a stranger, the interaction tends to be more welcomed, enjoyable, and mood-boosting than expected. In other words, we all assume nobody wants to talk to anybody, but in fact they do, and it can be pretty enjoyable. And it's just uh, uh, it's a matter of being courageous and brave enough to to spark that conversation. Like, hey, those are cool shoes. Where'd you get them? Or, hey, I like that wallet. Could I hold it for a second? Um, so yeah. this happens to me all like the time that. on travel. Yeah. yeah. Like when I'm traveling, like I, 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 I'm so prone to like throwing in the headphones, maybe like even throwing a hood on sometimes kind of yeah. like getting over to my corner, like in the lounge or wherever I'm at. But then when someone strikes up a conversation, it's funny because even though I'm a psychologist initially, sometimes I'll be kind of like, Oh man, I don't want to do this. It's almost a little bit aggravating, yeah. but most of the con conversations I have are very fruitful and it's just great to connect with someone else. And I end up enjoying it. Same thing with like Uber rides. 
rides. So when yeah. I'm flying out a lot to San Diego, I have to drive, you know, take an Uber from the airport up to Encinitas where Hanu's headquarters is located. It's like a 30 minute drive. It's always just easier to like not get on my phone. Oh, it is easier to get on my phone, but I try not to and just chat with the Uber driver. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I mean, there is, by the way, I was joking. Don't ask people if you can hold their wallet. Um, I, (laughs) I think that maybe if, if I, I sometimes get into this mode and it's, it's almost like mini celeb mode where I sometimes just don't want to be blasted with a bunch of questions about the podcast and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I, that goes through my head sometimes. So I do kind of do like the hoodie headphones on thing just because I'm like, gosh, I like I got to get to my next place. I know if I start a conversation, I'll have to be that asshole that ends it early. But I mean, right. you know, maybe a lot of other people listening in don't have that issue. I, I don't want to sound all like, you know, <laughs> you, like you and your things. celebrity status, yeah, uh, your yeah, influencer it's definitely status. N- not really celebrity status, but you, you, you get what I'm saying. But either way, I mean, like, everybody comes up to me, Ben, and they're like, dude, are you the sidekick on the Ben? Uh, Life podcast. I'm like, yeah, that's yeah, me. That's that's me. Watch so yeah, people do want to talk. People do want to talk. Number two, you underestimate how much new acquaintances like you. So after meeting someone at a party, you might go home and think, boy, I was awkward. They probably think I'm a real goober. They actually said goober in the article. What's goober? They say goober? goober, like an old, like deep Southern saying. That's, that's Google, a, Google. We use that pretty, well, we use that pretty often here in the South. Go- yeah. Goober. What's goober? Yeah. What, what, how, what would somebody who's a goober be just like socially awkward or kind of like awkward? Yeah. Oh. Socially mm. awkward. Just kind of like a little bit like off. Goober just yeah. an awkward word. Okay. Well, anyways, they say, actually they probably don't. Researchers call the mismatch between what you think people think of you and what they really do think of you. The liking gap. And it can last a long time. We tend to spend a lot of time ruminating on how poorly we think we came off to others others. But in reality, most of the time, people liked you a lot more than you think that they actually liked you. Or at least they disliked you far less than you think that they disliked you. So basically, you're your own harshest judge when it comes to social interactions, oh, which 100%. I think makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Number three, you underestimate how much people will care about intimate disclosures. Most people say they'd like to move beyond small talk to have deeper and more meaningful conversations with new acquaintances, but they're reluctant to share the kind of revelations that would make those deeper conversations possible because they think it'll be awkward and they don't think people will be interested. But in reality, research those people care about the intimate details of your life more than you think. Yeah, Meaning. with to, like with with the proverbial line in the sand. There's like some things, like <laughs> times where people just go <laughs> a little bit too far, hey. and you're sitting on, next to the person on the plane, and they want to tell you about their sex life. It's never uh, happens to check me. Out but I, this I guarantee it's happened to somebody. Growth that just sprouted from my left <laughs> right. butt cheek. That's red. and yeah. has a hair coming out the middle of it. What do you think of that? We're talking. Luckily, we're, I'm just a psychologist. We're talking. I mean, this happened to me last night um, at pickleball. Someone came up to me and said, "Hey." Um, you know, how is so-and-so doing? It was someone who we both deeply cared about. And I went just like straight into this conversation about like sexual trauma and, mm. uh, and, uh, relationships and, um, you know, and, and substance abuse discussions. And there was a brief second where we're like, we're standing on a pickleball court talking about this is kind of awkward, but then it was way more meaningful than them just coming up and being like, I don't know. Hey, you know, this snow is crazy, isn't it? Did you have as yeah. hard a time driving here as I did? Like, I, I think that when we get into these intimate details, it does allow us to connect to humans on a far deeper level. And you're right, Jay, you don't want to overshare. But sometimes I think that not going deep puts us in this shallow conversation mode and we'll leave a dinner party or something asking ourselves, geez, what actually occurred there besides us like eating food that we're going to poop out three days later and having a martini? Right. Versus having those deep conversations. And that's where I actually really like owning like one of those table topic sets or conversation starter sets, which obviously like the party section of any bookstore has a ton that you can thumb through. And so does Amazon if you want to look at them before you get them. But just having a few of those around, we do them as a family sometimes. And you don't take them to a restaurant with you with friends or take them out on social outings, but they start to train you about some conversations that are really interesting. I think the most interesting is there's a essay you can find online somewhere. It's called like 36 questions that make people fall in love. And they actually oh, did research on questions that if asked over time cause love and a relationship to blossom. So 
<laughs> anyways, get yeah. comfortable That's asking me. questions that are a little bit deeper than how about yeah. them Red Sox. Uh, okay. Right. You underestimate how much someone else will be thinking about you after conversing. You have a meaningful and interesting conversation with a stranger and find yourself chewing on the things discussed in the hours and even days afterwards. You figure the conversation didn't feel as significant to the other person. They're not doing the same, but that's wrong. Studies demonstrate people remain on their conversation partner's minds more than they knew and remember their stories and revisit their advice. That's really good information. I mean, if you're going to say something that's uplifting to someone or help them out, don't discount how much that might actually mean to them and how much they're going to remember that and think about it even after you've left. I think yeah, it's, for it's sure. a really important point. I, I wonder if, I'm sure, I should probably know this um, in my psychology studies. I wonder, though, if there has been studies to demonstrate um, how people might focus on maybe negative aspects of the conversation, both for themselves and things that the other person said, whether we're internalizing things that they said and interpreting it in our own kind of kind of crazy narrative or distorted narrative. I think what yeah. this article is getting at is how we can underestimate kind of the power of our words in a positive direction and how much they are yeah. thinking about that conversation and that interaction. I would assume that probably the opposite side of that spectrum is also true. Uh, but yes, to, to put a damper on everything, I thought I should throw that in there. Yeah. Yeah. And there's actually a scientific term for it. It's called the thought gap after conversation, underestimating the frequencies of others thoughts about us. So yeah, people think about the conversations you have and ruminate on them for better or worse long after you've had them longer than you'd think. Uh, number five, you underestimate how willing people are to help you. We're often reluctant to ask for help because we figure the people we ask are likely to say no. And if even if they say yes, they'll feel put out by the request. But studies show people are much more likely to comply with requests for help from people uh, more than people predict and feel more positively about giving help. And I think it's yeah. um, it's a way of making friends, right? Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin who asked one of his enemies or rivals or political rivals or something like that to – it was something simple you know, from a help standpoint. I think it was to borrow a book. And it was, I believe, as a way of developing some kind of friendship with that person. I could be totally it, yeah. bastardizing no, that you, story. You're right. It was either him or Teddy Roosevelt. I think it might be Benjamin Franklin. You might be right. But it was like the most prized possession of that individual. Yeah. So it wasn't just like any other book. So what he was asking for was a huge ask. Um, and he didn't think he was going to be willing to do it. But he did. Um, so, yeah, yeah I'm, it, might, it, was, it was a famous victor, uh, figure in history. I just don't remember then who it was. But, yeah. I tried that with my neighbor. It actually worked out pretty well. I <laughs> nice. trespassed across her lawn, and she's very particular about her lawn, and she got kind of mad at me, and she called and left a voicemail and told me that I wasn't allowed near her house anymore. And so two days later, mm. I called her back and asked her if I could play pickleball on her pickleball court, and it actually wound up being something she said yes to, and we're quite friendly with each other now. Nice. <laughs> there you go. And it was because so the, like, so- I asked her for help, and it wound up establishing and fostering a connection. Oh, I thought the takeaway was just trespass and, you know, you'll make best yeah. friends with yeah. your neighbor. That too. One thing, Ben, yeah. if listeners have not read either of these two books, they should. But it talks about – so one of the best uh, books I've ever read on the law of reciprocity, which is basically kind of like the give and take law, if you will, is a book called Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini. Oh, man, that looks uh, good. I mean, it is phenomenal. Um, and so we, we had to read it in like a social psychology class, numerous social psychology classes when I was in school, but it's still just a phenomenal read for so many people to, to, to come across, whether you're in sales or if you just genuinely want to know how to connect better to people, uh, yeah. talking about reciprocity and just doing things for people without asking or, or, or expecting anything, like you'll still probably get something back from them. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just a matter of asking. It's, and he it's has a, all sorts of cool little tips in there. Like if you're going to, ask for a favor because i've used this before when i've been late for a flight you you give a reason and you're far more likely to get that favor like let's say yeah. that you're you're uh well late for a flight's an obvious one like my flight is late can i cut in line or, or i'm sorry i'm late for my flight it's departing right now can i cut in front of you you're gonna get more than of course can i just cut in front of you in line right but then there are other things like um Let's say you are at a coffee shop, and I think there was another book related to this about asking for a discount on a coffee. You're far more likely to get a discount if you say something like, hey, I am a frequent customer here, 
And uh, I also, my dog got sick this month and I had a huge vet bill. So I'm really trying to watch my dollars, so to speak. Is there any way that you might be able to give me a 10% discount on the coffee? Or maybe you could yep. try this tactic and get the person in front of you or behind you to pay for your coffee. But anyways, he, he basically, <laughs> right. Robert's like this whole, you know, study or student of human behavior. And he basically says, when you ask someone to do you a favor, you're going to be far more successful if you provide a reason. People like to have yep. reasons for what they do. Yep. And I mean, the whole book's just jam packed with good stuff like that. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably, that one. And then how to win friends and influence people by yes. Carnegie. It's like yeah. another just like phenomenal classic that people need to read that talks a lot about that rule as well. Yeah. Yeah. That was absolutely. Okay. Um, let's do, I'm, I'm going, I want to make sure that we get a chance to take a few questions from Twitter, but let's shoot, let's go with one more from this article and then I'll link to the article for folks who actually want to read it. So go to bengreenfieldlife.com slash 454. Um, let's go, let's maybe go with the last one. You underestimate how much someone will appreciate you checking in with them, right? Like you write a text to an old friend say, Hey, I was just thinking about you today. How have you been? And then you think, gosh, they're just going to think I'm weird for reaching out out of the blue like that. But research finds people appreciate a check-in message more than you think. And often, the more surprising it is or the more distant you've been, the more that it makes their day, which I think is really cool. And, and I, you know, I, I weave this into my own life in a variety of ways. Uh, I'll give you two examples. The first is pretty obvious. I call my mom. I call my dad, too, but I call my mom pretty frequently. And sometimes I think, gosh, it's, I'm calling her up. I only have five minutes. I'm, I'm literally just going to say, hey, mom, how are you? Uh, tell me about what you did this morning, right? But that right. is, it. it's appreciated. It doesn't have to be some big, long chat. But people really appreciate you checking in with them. The other thing I have is there's a variety of people who I've committed to, like we've been out to dinner and I've said, how can I pray for you? Or mm -hmm. I've met them and I've, I've helped them in some way or established a connection and I want to keep in touch with them. I actually use a service uh, called, well, there, there's one called Relatable that's really good. I don't use that because I just basically, I, I found out about Relatable after I already started using this other one. I didn't, I was too lazy to move everything over. Um, I use one called Text Magic. And so I've got all these different lists in Text Magic of collections of different friends and contacts who I want to check in with. And when I want to check in, sometimes there's like 20 different people. And so I send the text magic text to the whole group. When it arrives, it doesn't have the whole group CC'd. It's coming individually from me. People can reply individually and respond. I'm very straightforward. I don't pretend that I'm sending an individual personalized text when in fact it is a group text. But I actually tell these people, hey, I occasionally will send interesting information, texts, encouragement, quotes, et cetera, to some of my close friends or VIPs. Would you care if I added you to that? And about one or two times a month, I'll come across an interesting quote or inspirational image or something I want to say or a new book I read that I thought was really good or a YouTube video I want to share. And I share it with these people. I, haven't, I don't think I've ever, actually once, one time, this one person who I probably didn't get, didn't get to know well enough or something, they replied with that one text stopping line stop. But besides right. that, yeah. everybody's just like, they love it. And at one point I stopped yeah. for a while and I saw one of my friends at a party. And the reason I stopped for a while was I was having some tech issues with the software. And they're like, how come you don't text me anymore? And I'm like, oh, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Like this actually means something, those brief check-ins. So check in with people and don't worry if you got to figure out a way to scale it like I did, especially if you have a big relationship capital network, it's about the checking in that counts. So right. I thought that was a really yeah. good one too. Research finds people appreciate a check-in message more than you'd think. I like that this article has yeah. a lot of research back stuff too. They're not just, you know, blowing smoke or throwing stuff up. Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. The one part about checking in that I have really enjoyed both giving and then receiving uh, is also checking in, but then doing it also with gratitude. Um, so just saying, you know, something that you're grateful for, you know, I thought about you today, just something as simple as that when I receive those types of messages, but also when I send them, uh, there's something that just kind of goes right to the heart and soul, which yeah. is, which is pretty cool. Um, so I, I think that the gratitude component when also adding it to the check-in component can be a really yes. great, uh, great flair, if you will. Also emoticons, hardy emoticons, emoticons. maybe a gorilla and a deer and like the little flamey egg, fire. Eggplant, uh -huh. peach. Yeah. Not the right. eggplant. No, 
<laughs> no, is the dick, peach a thing okay. too? Is is the peach? The peach a thing? is the butt. Yeah, the okay. peach is the butt. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. I knew what the eggplant was. I didn't know the peach. That's why I've been sending you peaches I'm... all the time. Yeah. Ah, now, now you know. Now I know. Okay, <laughs> awkward. Um, okay, right. last one. Uh, the the National Journal of Strength Conditioning Research published something that I was kind of aware of already, but they researched it. And it was on isometric training and its influence on dynamic sprint performance. You wouldn't think that isometrics, meaning dropping into a certain position and holding it with a high amount of tension without moving, would be something that would result in better performance while moving. But what this study found was there was a significant impact in sprint performance when isometric training was included in one's training protocol. Now, I'm actually a pretty big fan of isometric training. I use it with a lot of my clients. I, I think that I first got really into isometric training when I met. So uh, Dave Asprey had a conference, and it was like the very first ever biohacking conference. It was in, um, uh, I think it was in San Francisco. And I interviewed a guy who I met at that conference named Jay Schroeder. And Jay basically had an old school Russian ARP electro stimulation device that he attached. It was just a handful of guys like me, Aubrey Marcus, the fat burning guy, Abel James was there. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because a lot of people who were there initially, they're now like big podcasters and fitness bloggers and stuff. We were all just like <laughs> nobodies, like whatever, 15 years ago when we went to Dave Asprey's conference and, um, and, and it was tiny. It was just like, uh, there was literally like maybe a couple dozen people in this tiny little basement room in San Francisco, but there were some of these biohacking things there. And Jay Schroeder who trains a bunch of NFL athletes, Olympic trainers, marathoners, et cetera. He's super into combining long isometric holds with electrical muscle stimulation. Now, I interviewed him, and I'll link to that interview about this whole program that he uses where he combines the two. But obviously, those Russian ARP units, like the, the newbie is an example of that. And I've done an interview on the newbie before. They're expensive. I mean, we're yeah. talking like $10,000 plus dollar machines. But you don't have to have one of those to get the benefits of isometric training. Although I would argue that blood flow restriction bands can definitely amp up the benefits of an isometric exercise. But the idea behind them is that they they allow you to recruit more muscle while you're training. And they've actually they actually found you can build muscle just as effectively as other muscle building exercises, meaning like an isotonic exercise, which would be traditional training where you're moving a joint through full range of motion, or isokinetic exercise where the muscle is kept at a at a certain speed during exercise. That would be like the ARX machine, for example. Well, mm -hmm. isometric exercise, what you get is this huge increase in what's called peak tension. So your mitochondria and what's called your sarcoplasmic protein synthesis, that gets increased in some cases by over 100% when you're doing isometric training because of the amount of force demand that's placed on a tissue. Because when you're moving a muscle through the range of motion, your muscle only hits peak tension during a tiny, tiny fraction of that movement. But when you're in isometrics, like doing a deep squat hold versus moving through a barbell or dumbbell or goblet squat, or doing a long push-up hold while instead of doing a regular push-up. Or, you know, for example, I do a lot of this stuff using my power plate vibration platform, like a long bridge <laughs> hold versus doing Romanian deadlifts or a bridge. They've actually shown there's a lot of interesting research behind this, a huge increase in the amount of muscle fibers that are activated over and above moving, which is probably why there's this crossover effect into performance and why guys who train, you know, NFL athletes like Jay Schoder, for example, will use this type of training to get really good results. Now, you can, of course, go cheap old school style and just do push-up position holds at the hardest range of motion, squat position holds, you know, boat holds like an abdominal core hollow position. But there are some pretty cool devices out there. Like there's this one book, it's called um, The Ultimate Isometrics Manual. It's this manual of all the best isometric exercises out there. But in that mm -hmm. manual is uh, a device that they use. And I have one out in my gym. I don't use it as much because I'm just, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm mentally weak. Isometric training sure, is kind of mentally demanding because you're like, Dude, it's rough. you're pushing and you're not moving. It'd be like somebody saying, hey, go like bench press or push against this wall as hard as you can for two minutes. 
In my book, pushing against the wall as hard as you can for two minutes is way more mentally demanding than yeah, just like bench pressing. But I got this thing it's called an ISO chain. So the, the one two combo of having that ISO chain, and I used it for a few months when I first got it just to experiment with it, and it was incredibly effective. Because the other cool thing about isometric exercises is, is you're far less likely to incur injury because you're not moving the joint through a range of motion. So you can just keep coming back over and over and over again and doing a, a lot of these big exercises, you know, including like chest press, squat, deadlift, curl, like you name it, but you're just holding the bar. It's got a little force plate in there telling you how much force that you're producing. And it's a, it's a cool little idea. So it's, it's called an ISO chain. And the name of that book, if you want like a manual for this, is called the Ultimate Isometrics Manual. So that's one good resource. Another interesting one, another book, and this is one I've used more often with my clients and with myself. I'll, I typically throw in about anywhere from a six to a 12 week block during the year where I do this style of training. It's called Neuromass, Neuromass. And it's a book written by John Bruni, super interesting. But this is basically a series of sets you do. You do like a set for the chest, a set for the back, a set for the arms, a set for the legs, et cetera. But it's what's called a grinding movement where you're doing super slow. Let's use a squat mm -hmm. for an example, just a body weight squat or a very lightly loaded squat. Super slow squat, like 30 seconds up, 30 seconds down, and you do that for around two minutes. So a lot of time under tension. And then a speed or explosive movement. So the muscle's already exhausted, and then you'll do like 10 jump squats, right? After you've done those super slow grinding squats. And then the final component of the neuro set is you then drop into an isometric position and hold for as long as you can. It's mm. crazy hard and crazy effective, especially if you have minimal training equipment. So again, grind for like, it, can, it doesn't have to be as long as two minutes. It could even be for just 60 to 90 seconds. So super slow. Then same type of exercise, but explode through that range of motion you were just doing super slow for a very short period of time, like 10 to 15 seconds. And then finish dropping into the hardest range of motion for that movement that you've just done the grind and the explosive movement with and hold that for 30 to 60 seconds. So it's called Neuromass. John has a bunch of research in his That's book behind it, but it actually works really well all the clients who I've programmed that with, like they they report back and A, they love it, even though it is kind of mentally demanding because that isometric component especially, you burn a yeah. bunch when you do this. If you use blood flow restriction bands when you do neuromass, it is next level. But again, okay, that's, we're talking a, about, that's exactly what I was just about to ask you. If yeah. there was an advantage or if there was potential disadvantages to doing that workout with a BFR band. Yeah. Like let's say it was somebody who's maybe not as trained. It seems mm -hmm. like that could be pretty intense to do with BFR. But if someone's yeah. maybe well conditioned, then it might make I, sense. I think definite advantages. Yeah. 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 And he has the whole program laid out in there. And so that Neuromass book is really good. So that'd be another one that would not require something big like the ISO chain. And then the last one, my wife laughs at me sometimes, as have some of my seatmates on long airplane flights, but I've always got this little thing in my bag. It's called an Active 5, spelled with no E, A-C-T-I-V-5. It's a tiny little force transducer. I think the guy who told me about it was um, Adam Van Rothfelder from Strong Coffee, who was like the personal trainer and won that TV show Strong. And he was, mm. I think he was over at my house, and he, he had it in his bag, and he took it out and took me through a little mini workout with it. But what it does, is it ties to a phone app and it gamifies. You'll be like flying a spaceship and when you want the spaceship to go faster, you press harder and during the recovery period, you kind of let off a little bit. And you can yeah. do anything from like chest press, shoulder press, curls, triceps, but it's this tiny little thing, smaller than a cell phone. And by pressing against it and then also having that phone app in front of you that's kind of like walking you through the whole workout. And all the workouts are short. They're like 10 to 20 minutes long. Some are a little shorter than that. Man, for like we drive to Seaside, Oregon, for example, for family vacation in the summers, and I'll typically give myself a challenge of doing three isometric workouts on the six hour drive down and then three more on the six hour drive back. And I'll be like sweating and I got the window rolled down because I'm starting to get funky and, <laughs> and my wife's laughing and I'm grinting and grinding like I'm taking a crap. And it, it's it's again like the size of a hockey puck. It's actually a pretty cool device, especially because it gamifies yeah. everything, tracks all your force, tracks your results. And there's, it's just like this little dot that, that's rising and falling. I think I said spaceship. I don't I think it's a spaceship. It's more like a Pac-Man style dot. Yeah. But anyways, yeah. that thing is super like, cool for isometric training though. too. Yeah, it's basically yeah, biofeedback. Yeah, and yeah. speaking of taking little work breaks, perfect for a cubicle or a workstation. If she's want right. to stop and do some isometrics, I'm flying to Portugal on Friday to 
uh, speak at this six senses retreat for a week. And I guarantee like I'll, I'll get at least two of those workouts in on the flight to Portugal and two on the way back and, you know, I'll wear deodorant and make sure I don't get too funky, but yeah, yeah. It, it, it works amazingly well. That's cool. So, Have you ever used that, uh, the, the grip, um, isometric trainer, I think it's called Zona plus they sent me one yeah. years ago and, yeah. uh, and I tried, I think they use it more for like hypertension, high blood pressure. It's, it's um, FDA approved for high blood pressure. Yeah. 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 It's just, that's a pretty interesting device too. I didn't know if that was, it had any other application other than like, you know, for high blood pressure I didn't know grip strength, maybe it could be a potential, uh, small esque isometric workout, I, but I own one and I've used it and compared to just like those freaking like captains of crush hand grip strengtheners. It's not that difficult. I mean, it's kind of difficult, but it's more yeah. like medical management of high blood pressure, which it works for. My mom has high blood pressure and I got one for her and uh, it's, you know, flies under the radar compared to BP meds or like, you know, beat yeah. infrared sauna, magnesium, a lot of these other natural modalities that are often recommended for blood pressure, but it actually does work and they've got good research behind yeah, it. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, the Zona. nice. yeah. So I'll link to all that stuff, all those articles, podcasts, books, little devices, articles, which I just said twice, I must be tired, uh, in the show notes at bengreenfieldlife.com slash 454. Now, I know that we are a little bit, I don't think, I think I misused the phrase long in the tooth, don't I? Long in the tooth means old. Right? And people give yeah. you, people give you shit about that. Hey, um, I just caught myself. You did yeah. catch yourself. So everybody's <laughs> going to sing the praises now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. So here's the deal. If you're on Twitter right now, uh, come online and ask a question. Uh, you can raise your hand somehow to ask it. And uh, then when you ask the question, We'll br or, or when you raise your hand, we'll bring you online and we'll pump up the volume, pump up the volume and you can ask your question. Um, did that fly over your head, by the way, Jay? I said pump up the volume it, just like they do in the song. No, I, I, I love it, man. Oh, here we go. Um, Gar garden. Uh, okay. Gar garden of words. Go ahead and ask your question now. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks for doing this face, you guys. Um, so I was going to say, um, my question is, at the beginning of the year, I was kind of praying about the year to come. And one of the things that became apparent was that um, this year I wasn't going to have any alcohol. And so I gave up alcohol. And subsequently, kind of, I think I've been consuming probably more coffee and probably more calories uh, in the evening. And I just wanted to pick your brain and see if you have any thoughts. But um, I've noticed that my skin seems to be a little bit more irritable. irritable is the right word, um, more like, uh, just like kind of acne, just things that get bothered. You know, um, if I have an ingrown hair, it just gets really irritated, which is, this is new. It's definitely a change. And my wife commented on it too. And so I don't know if you guys have any thoughts, um, specifically with that context. That's the only thing that I can pinpoint that's really definitely changed from the past five years. Wait, you quit drinking alcohol and now you feel like your skin is getting irritated? Yeah, I, the only reason I included that because I would I wouldn't think those are directly linked, but um, it I've been increasing coffee consumption and a little increase in calories. But I just was curious, even just in general, about um, your ideas about how to support um, for I don't know pimples and ingrown hairs and stuff. It just seemed to be more prevalent. Did you make other like major dietary changes besides removing alcohol? Uh, not really. Um, so for the first two months. I just noticed that in the evenings, um, I did start drinking decaf coffee in the evenings. Um, and so I, I've kind of recently cut back a little bit um, just because I, I was drinking like four or five cups a day, two or three caffeinated. But um, the only thing that I came across was uh, there was an interview with Paul Check, and he, I think it was Wade Lightfoot as well. And he talked about pa parasites potentially and coffee. Um, oh, the skin irritation, but that's the only thing, but I'm just curious okay. because I've been right. doing research on it. And I haven't yeah. found anything specific. I, I, I think I suspect what's, what's going on here now. Okay, cool. So anytime that we make a dietary change and we remove something from the diet, that often gets replaced by something else. And sometimes the unhealthy thing that we removed is helping us out from a health standpoint, but the thing that we thought was healthy that we replaced it with is causing issues. And in this case, you're right. 
uh, not only can a lot of people run into fringe, not often expected issues from a gut standpoint when they add in a whole bunch of what was technically a legume or a bean like coffee. But coffee is, I guess, back to Dave Asprey, he kind of made this popular. It can be a notoriously dirty food like mold, mycotoxins, and even a parasite component. So let's cut straight to the chase since I know we're starting to run out of time on this podcast. And I'm going to tell you because there's like, it's dizzying the number of like parasite eradication protocols that are out there. You could always like take a stab in the dark, try what I would consider to be the best parasite eradication protocol that I've used and see if it clears up your skin while simultaneously switching to like really organic clean coffee. I didn't pay you to come on and ask this question, but I do know a good coffee company. What, what starts, company would you starts, choose, Ben? I, starts I, out of a, all the companies, what would you yeah, choose? Yeah, it starts with a K and winds with Leon. Um, <laughs> anyways, though, so best parasite eradication protocol in my in my book High dose oil of oregano combined with proteolytic enzymes for two weeks while cutting out anything that feeds the yeast, namely fermented sugary drinks like kombucha, beer, which it sounds like you've already eliminated, uh, um, wine, uh, starches, sugars. Yeast love to eat those critters or those critters love to eat sugar. So avoid that stuff. And then what I mean by oregano and proteolytic enzymes Basically, and this is probably what you heard from Wade because he has a company that makes high-dose proteolytic enzymes, and they actually work. So his are called masszymes. Um, Keon makes one called Flex. The way that I have my clients do it who get parasites, and this just knocks them out flat, and they're clean when they retest, when they do a stool test within a couple of weeks. We dose with oil of oregano, like a full dropper full of two of really potent oil of oregano. It's okay to put it in water three times a day for two weeks. Because parasites, it's nasty to think about, but their eggs hatch and they come out at different times. So you got to hit it over and over and over again. This is not to be misconstrued as medical advice, by the way. I'm not a doctor. Proceed at your own risk. This is just what I would do if I were in your shoes. So high dose oil of oregano, amazing for candida, yeast, fungus, etc., which can manifest topically, by the way, as can some of these parasitic issues. And then you combine that with high dose proteolytic enzymes. The way I do that is 12 Keon Flex in the morning. 12 Keon Flex in the evening, which breaks down the biofilm that the Candida reside in. If you get gastric upset from that much Keon Flex, you can go as low as six in the morning, six in the evening. So it's oil of oregano three times a day, which crushes parasites. They hate that stuff, combined with high dose enzymes. In this case, I'll use the Keon Flex, but that bioptimizer stuff that Wade's company makes will, will also work. And you do that morning and evening uh, with the oil of oregano and with cutting out the sugars and the starches that feed the yeast. And that just freaking works. So that's what I would do. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's, what? I want to just make one comment. And again, this is me um, not making any assumptions on his end on how much alcohol he was intaking versus none now. Uh, but one of the things that I've seen kind of clinically in working with patients is that individuals who go from drinking, you know, let's say appreciable amounts of alcohol to no alcohol, especially if they're using it as a stress mitigation tactic, uh, when the alcohol is there, it can actually be quite effective in the short term. We know it has a lot of long-term uh, deleterious effects, but in the short term, a lot of people's anxiety gets relieved when they drink, you know, alcohol. Then when they come off of it, the body kind of going through its tolerance and withdrawal effects alongside if there aren't kind of like these effective mechanisms for managing stress, then we'll see people actually break out in their skin. We'll see them um, mm -hmm. have other kind of gut related issues. We see all of these things start to manifest because they didn't replace that behavior that was helping them to mitigate the effects of stress. They didn't replace it with something adaptive. And so again, I'm not saying that's something that he's dealing with, but if anybody else is doing something like that and have noticed symptoms arise that are either similar to what he's experiencing or otherwise. I think stress is a key component that, again, it may not be the most sexy topic in the world, but it's one that everybody has to address. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So uh, fringe question, but I feel so much closer, so much closer to uh, <laughs> to Garden of, what's his name? Gar Gar Brett, Brett, Garden of Words. That's I feel right. so much closer now that he's shared something vulnerable with us, as we've learned in today's podcast. Uh, we're out of time. We are out of time. Yeah. Uh, however, I would highly recommend that you go to the show notes at bengreenfieldlife.com slash 454 if you want to leave your own comments, your feedback, your questions for Jay or for me. 
And uh, Jay, you're ready to go do a do an isometric squat hold while eating a salad full a while. of ground flax seeds. Go on a walk yeah. and meet Wanna somebody walk. new and share something vulnerable and embarrassing with them. I think that's, that's everything that we learned. That's the plan. That's everything yes. that we learned. So I'll do yes. all of the above right now. And inquire as to whether or not they have a parasite. And if so, you know how to help them now. <laughs> that I do. All right, folks. Well, that's all for now. Thanks for listening in. And, uh, oh, you heard me read a little bit about Boundless Parenting in the very beginning, the intro of this podcast. Available now, boundlessparentingbook.com. You can read more about what Brian Johnson feeds his kids besides liver and testicles. There you have it. All right. Have an amazing day, folks. Over and out. Over and out.